Hello, everyone. This is Jerry Scarla with Nitro Security. We're starting a webcast today, hosted by Electric Energy Online. Today's topic is situational awareness in industrial networks. And we're joined by two industry expert speakers, Brian Singer and Eric Knapp. First, I'd like to thank Electric Energy Online for organizing today's webcasts, and we look forward to working with them in the future. Second, for folks who would like to download the PowerPoint and follow along, you can find it on the Nitro Security website, which is nitrosecurity.com slash webcasts. We will be taking questions at the end of the webcast. Please submit those by opening the Q&A box in the bottom right corner of the GUI, and we'll be directing those to the appropriate panel member. So let's get started. Our topic today is situational analysis in industrial networks, an early warning system for energy, chemical, nuclear, and other industrial systems. Network behavior and security events can be measured and analyzed to indicate errors, anomalies, and threats to our information infrastructure. Industrial processes can also be measured and analyzed for availability, performance, and quality. What happens when you correlate both metrics together? You can achieve an early warning system that exceeds the capabilities of current firewalls and intrusion detection systems, providing the situational awareness needed to protect critical industrial processes. I'm pleased to welcome two speakers to today's webcast. The first is Brian Singer, Principal Investigator with Connexus Security Corporation. Brian is Principal Investigator and Vice President of Connexus, and he is also the Co-Chairman of the ISA 99 Industrial Automation and Control System Security Committee. Brian has over 17 years of experience in computer system security, including nine years specializing in industrial automation and control system security, critical infrastructure protection, and counterterrorism. Also joining us today and following Brian is Eric Knapp, the Director of Critical Infrastructure Markets for Nitro Security. Eric has over a decade of experience in telecommunications and internet security technology focused on the security of industrial automation networks and control systems. Eric is considered an expert in applied Ethernet technologies and is the author of the upcoming book on industrial network security. With that, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Brian Singer. Brian, please take it away. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today. Uh, what we'd like to talk about, obviously, I am coming in to speak more as from the role of, uh, of uh, what we do in, in, within uh, industrial automation, uh, the operator, the, the asset owner communities, and from an international standards perspective. Uh, so I am the co-chair of the ISA 99 standard. I've also been involved with the NERC CIP standards and a variety of others. Uh, and kind of looking back at the generations of this field and, and how we've come to where we currently sit today, uh, we, we still have a very large problem out there and even recognizing that there have been any type of incidents that have happened within an industrial network. So my presentation today is going to be on correlating risk events and process trends to improve reliability. So taking this from a basic aspect of how do we make, make sure that we maintain safe and efficient operations of an industrial process? What are the events that are happening within an industrial network? What are the threats to that? How do we detect and respond to those types of events in a timely manner so that we maintain the key focus again, safe and efficient operations of the process? What I'm going to use for the purposes of the discussion today is a generic PLC, HMI, or controller type architecture uh, and mostly focused on the TCP IP arena. Now, that th these a lot of the things we'll talk about are directly applicable to whether you use a SCADA or a DCS or, or however you might also classify your environment. Uh, but again, for the purpose of simplicity, 
for the purposes of just uh, trying to keep some vision today in one direction, we're going to focus on a generic PLC HMI controller type architecture and on Ethernet. Though again, a lot of these, a lot of the findings and a lot of the things we discuss can be directly applicable to other architecture as well. The session will focus on ICS network behaviors and vulnerabilities irrespective of the cause. And the point I have behind this is I really don't care if it's a network fault or if it's a virus or if it's an intentional attacker or if it's a mistake on the network. Whatever is happening on the network, if it has an impact to the industrial process, I consider that to be within the scope of things that we want to be able to detect and respond to, again, to maintain that focus of safe and efficient operations of an industrial process. I'm going to use today one particular KPI that I found to be very effective and, and fairly commonplace, especially in process industries, which is OEE, overall equipment effectiveness. Uh, I've selected this just for the fact, fact that it is a what we call a complex calculated KPI or key performance indicator. So it is a, a measure of machine efficiency and performance within a line that uses a lot of different uh, factors measured. And they're typically going to be compared inside a historian in order to be able to calculate, calculate the overall efficiency of an operation and whether or not we're achieving those targets. I found it to be a very effective technique uh, when trying to analyze root cause and failure analysis and industrial failures and industrial automation or industrial network failures rather, uh, and also in doing correlation of uh, network security trends. Emphasis is going to be on process improvement and intelligence uh, intelligence of what's going on in the, pro of the process more than on security. And I think the principal po the point here is I really don't care if it's an intentional, unintentional, malicious, or, or non-malicious. The behavior is the behavior. The negative problem is the negative problem, and those are the things we want to try to avoid. Uh, it just so happens that most of the things that we're going to detect at this level have the corollary benefit when we address them of both fixing intentional and unintentional issues. So talk about this very quickly. You know, we always hear the proverbial fight of IT versus engineering, and I, I don't want to start that whole discussion again today. But there is something that was really unique about looking at industrial networks in terms of even though we're using the same communications technologies, the same topologies, uh, a lot of the same types of networking protocols, the behavior of the network protocols down at the industrial network tends to be quite a bit different. So on a, on a traditional IT network, so let's say somebody is going to browse a website or they're going to send an email or something like that, most of this traffic is characterized by frequently, by, by short TCP times, small amounts of data exchanged. Think about I'm going out to a website, I connect to the website, I download a page, the connection goes idle for a period of time, and then I'm going to click on a link, I go out and I do the same thing again. So typically very short TCP times overall, uh, you know, a fairly finite number of TCP connections will be open during that time. Frequently those communications are also going to be off-site or client servers, so they're going to transit several network firewalls, several network devices, several router switches, things of that nature, to go from the client to the server and then make those communications go back up and down. And rarely are these time critical below a few seconds. You know, if it takes a few extra milliseconds to get an email, nobody even notices, right? But on an ICS network or an industrial control systems network, we, are, we typically see very long TCP connection times. So if I'm controlling a drive or I'm controlling a valve, I may open that communication up and I'm going to be, be, uh, be maintaining that connection and monitoring that connection over an ex extended amount of time in order to maintain the proper operation of that component. Momentary blips across this communication stream can cause fail-safe fail -safe, uh, fail -safe protocols to be enacted uh, and the, you know, the, product, the process will end up shutting down and quite, free, quite Quite frequently we actually see this. This is why when we have IT people typically come in to look at an industrial network, they often quite don't understand why they have intermittent failures on individual devices, drives, valves, and things of that nature, because they don't remember to look at the communication stream over time. The other thing that's also very, that we see very frequently is that most of the communications will be internal. If, if you cross a switch, you probably are only going to cross one or two switches. You probably are not going to go up to a corporate site. You're not going to go to an international site in order to be able to receive your entire instruction command. You're going to have all the data there locally. So as a result, there's typically not very many layers at which you're going to have an opportunity to inspect that traffic. Very limited external connections from an industrial network. Okay, 
So from an IT network monitoring perspective, we focus primarily on layers one and two of the OSI model. So I'm going to look at the physical communications. I'm going to look at the data lake communications. I'm going to be looking at the switch statistics. Cable analyzers are going to be used to look at the physical media. And I'm, the, the primary measure of performance of an IT network is typically looking at utilization packets per second, things of that nature, to make sure that the, that the network is able to perform. That's uh, it's kind of the measure that, we, that an IT network is. is this, network capable of, of, of maintaining the communications that we want out there. The monitoring is going to focus a lot more on the layers three through seven, I expect the user behavior, uh, unwanted traffic, applications misused out of policy, things of that nature. Now on the ICS process monitoring, even though all of those measures are important, rarely do we see things like utilization or network capacity actually be an issue on an industrial network. More often than not, we see physical network problems, we see uh, communication problems that happen because cable aren't set up correctly or they're run over with lots of noise. Uh, or we see, again, looking to the last slide, that we don't look at the communication stream over time and that momentary blips might be a problem. So the way we look at an industrial network we really have to add some additional layers of analysis in there in order to make full sense of the picture. So what I typically would say here is you have to look at all of the things that you looked at within the IT arena, so the layers one through seven, the, the communications protocols, the, the efficiency of the communications and all the rest of that, but you also have to compare that to what's actually going on at the process at the time. And in order to be able to do that, we typically would rely upon the process historian. Right. or the engineering workstations or other, other uh, trending and uh, trending and event recording workstations that will be out there that tell us what's happening in the process at the time of the communications. And if you don't look at both of those pieces, you're not going to get a full picture of what any particular performance uh, issue may be or success or failure of a particular network communication. Uh, and what you see on the, the diagram on below is a, an actual tra traffic capture where we are watching a communication path over time, and then we see this momentary dip at the end of it, and that was a enough to stop the entire communication. On an IT network, we probably wouldn't think anything of that. On a typical ICS network, even that momentary blip that you may see that is very typical in other networks, that, that is all that it often is going to take in order for the, the, uh, the ICS network and the components on that network to stop communicating, okay? Latency, latency on the network is the number one thing that we usually look at is, is the delay in communication. So uh, you, rarely do we actually see that utilization is going to be it. And if you look at this is again a capture from an actual network, I mean their maximum utilization was like nine megabits a second across hundreds of devices in the environment. There was really not that much going on. If an IT person was typically to look at this network, they'd take one look at it and say, you're at about 1% capacity on this network, you have nothing to worry about whatsoever. The problem is you start looking at all the things going going on underneath that, looking at the multicast traffic, looking at the broadcast traffic, looking at how long it takes a communication to go from all the, from one workstation to all the different points it has to communicate with before it can actually uh, execute the process instruction. And that latency, if there's any latency introduced that are outside of the fail-safe protocols for an industrial process, well, the control system devices are going to do exactly what we've designed them to do. They're going to probably shut down and fail safe. And we look at this and say, well, that's a failure of the process environment. Well, most likely not. It did exactly what we designed it to do to maintain safe operation. The key now is we have to get it to both safe and efficient operation as well. Now, again, using a typical PLC HMI controller type architecture uh, as the example here, even though this, this example will apply to DCS and SCADA type environments as well, this is just one for, this, for the sake of how much time we have to operate. Uh, a colleague of mine and I went through and analyzed one time and said, well, hey, if you send an instruction to a controller, how many different communications are going to be typical in that stream? So you're going, to send a, you're going to send a command. That command is going to come from an HMI. That command from the HMI is going to have been served by some type of HMI server. That server is going to have to connect to some other system out there typically to validate that command. It's going to have to go to the control protocol gateway. It's going to have to go to the controller. And if you look at the communication over time, we found that quite frequently that in a single process, a single process instruction can take as many as 19 independent TCP sessions in order to be able to execute the full instruction. 
right? Any latency anywhere within that chain could result in some type of a, of a delay or failure. So whereas a typical communication is going to go off network in an IT network and then come back with all the data, we may have to make 19 different communications to various components within that architecture before we can actually execute that command. Any, any type of interruption in there is very likely to cause the process to actually stop. And if you look at this diagram, you'll see that, again, most of these communications are well behind the firewall. They're behind the routers. They're behind the points that most people would typically go to look at to be able to inspect that traffic. Okay? And this doesn't even really include if somebody deliberately wanted to go after there. Uh, any attack on the IT network, most of the attacks we've seen to date so far where people have actually gone after an ICF's network have been out there to create deliberate latency within the environment, or what we call a denial of service event. Uh, now we're actually seeing a class of attacks start to develop that are very targeted at the ICS protocols and the ICS environments themselves. Uh, an example of that includes what we have seen with the recent Stuxnet virus, and there's plenty of resources out there to talk about that, uh, but, you know, again, that is an example of the changing attack surface. Uh, most recently, we also have had a, a notification about what they're calling the Night Dragon attacks. So I believe you can go out and check on a variety of different sources to get information about Night Dragon uh, that are targeting at oil and gas facilities. Now, luckily, we have not seen those directly target the SCADA DCS environments yet, but they do appear to be gathering data out there so that people are able to start figuring out how these industrial processes as work. All right. Now, this, the, the source of the data here comes from a, an extended study uh, by World Tech Security Technologies. They, they, they went through and analyzed a number of different DCS controllers, SIS components, uh, and looking at network failures within the, in the devices. And what we found out there is you know, out of out of most of the vulnerabilities detected in IT in, in uh, industrial comp control systems, most of them actually have a network type failure associated with them. And I work most of the time as an, a consultant, mostly for owner operator uh, mostly for owner operator companies. And I can tell you that this is what we also see: that most of the failures in industrial components out there are have a network causal causal failure behind them. So you know, whereas a lot of people might want to go out and look for independent vulnerabilities or viruses or things, well, we're going to look for this one packet of death that's going to kill this particular device. That's not what we've seen be the typical attack model out there. Most people that go out to attack or that have any knowledge of being able to attack an industrial component, they're going to do it with some type of network traffic, right? Good design can mitigate most of these threats as well. Now, and and I, I, what I use here are the good design for an ICS network. The first one is the principle of least route, and that principle is very simple. It just says that I don't want I don't want industrial traffic going any further than it absolutely has to. So I don't want to take industrial traffic and move it off network and send it to another site for monitoring or anything else. I want to keep all of those industrial protocols, all that industrial pro traffic home as much as possible. Limit that by by firewall, limit that by ACL, limit it by the routers, whatever layer is required, because the more of that traffic that I move off network, the more opportunity I have to intercept, manipulate, and then use those protocols against the process. Use of a managed infrastructure, it's, uh, the, the cost of managed switching and networking gear today is getting low enough that, uh, that the, the barriers to entry on that are, are, uh, are, are also very low. Uh, what we've seen a few years ago is people say, I don't want to use layer three managed switches because I'm going to have to worry about the operators being able to deal with that at night. Well, that even in the industrial hardware gear, we're seeing that change very quickly as well, that industrial managed devices are coming out that have compact flash and USB cards on them that make it a lot easier for us to be able to manage the rules and configuration of those devices. And then certainly, isolation of high-risk domains. This is something you will see if you are familiar with the ISA 99 work at all. Uh, you'll find the zone and conduit model is one of the keystones that we use for architecture of an industrial process, uh, industrial process and an industrial network to protect high-risk networking domains from any type of compromise that we say, well, hey, if this is an ISO hydro cracker, if this is the generator, this is the, one of the mo most important parts of the process, we want to put it in its own network zone, we want to isolate it from communications as much as possible so that we don't have the opportunity for a virus or a worm or for a malware attack or anything of that other nature to come through and cause us to have a failure in that environment. 
So what are the impacts of ICS network faults? Again, I think it's really important here to say one of the, a lot of people really still hold on to the line in, in security that it's all about viruses and malware and things of that nature. We've really seen that not to be true in the last few years. Most of the attacks are what we would put into the uh, the advanced persistent threat or a lot of the directed type of attacks. They're custom. They're they are custom attacks. They are using the protocols against themselves. They're really we're not seeing nearly as many viruses and worms and things like that out there today. But I would say when I go in and I talk to most companies, many of them still think that it's going to be a virus that brings down or it's going to be an individual vulnerability on a device that's going to bring them down. That has not been what we've seen. All right. Well, let's talk about the industrial network for just a moment. And again, if you look back at the beginning of the of this slide presentation, industrial networks have all kinds of failures all the time that are completely without even thinking about the first security incident out there. But if I was an intentional person trying to cause harm to an industrial process, I'm most likely going to use the very techniques I know to cause problems on an industrial process in my attack. So what are those? Day-to-day, -day, what are the manifestations? We have application delays, your HMI screens are slow to update, things like that, update errors, poor performance, uh, discrepancies between various databases, nuisance trips of safety systems uh, shutting down, fail-safe protocols, unexplained shutdowns, uh, and we've even seen that be as high as extended shutdowns, dangerous failures. There's plenty of examples out there, including things like uh, the uh, Bellingham, Washington pipeline failure, the uh, t 2005 the Texas City refinery explosion, where we saw application of delays and issues within the network that were exacerbating factors in some of the dangerous failures that occurred. Now, I'll be very careful here. We're certainly not attributing any type of industrial security event to those. We are talking about the fact that there was a manifestation of the issues underneath there that were part of the overall, overall failure, not necessarily the causal factor. All right. The failure modes that we're concerned with typically, loss of view so that I don't see what's going on within the environment. These can be caused by all kinds of different issues, but I no longer see the accurate state of the process because the HMI screens aren't updating, they're updating with bad values or anything of that nature. Manipulation of view would be a class of attack that is definitely intentional where somebody is changing the view so that what I see, with, what I see on my operator screen is different from what the actual is that is occurring. Denial of control. Denial of control is on its way to becoming a dangerous failure, but, de but denial of control means I can still interact with the process. This is where the physics of the process start to become a factor. It says that maybe an attacker is able to go out there and d disable all your HMI screens so you're not able to interact with the process, but you can still go out and maybe hit, a, you know, hit an e-stop, have uh, manual controls, uh, manual breaker switches, things of that nature. You could still take control of the process. You could stop it, but you just don't have the normal mechanisms you, you would normally use to interact with it. And, that, and then the most dangerous of those failure modes would be a loss of control, which is now the physics have taken over. The, you know, the temperature's too high, the, the, the machine speeds are too high, vibration's gone out. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you do. At this point, you're going to have a catastrophic failure. If you go and you use these four, these four categories of failures, you can actually model just about any type of event we've, we've looked at in the past few years, and you can look at the progression of how an attacker disabled the view, how somebody changed the view, how operators took action that was contrary to what the state system state was. So in other words, they opened valves when they shouldn't because they didn't know that it was safe to do so or that it was dangerous to do so at that particular time, and eventually culminating in a loss of control. What we've often seen here is that these events, like look at the, 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 Texas, the 2005 Texas City explosion, look at the, uh, there was a Texaco refinery explosion back in the 90s, I believe. You look at those events, and they actually compounded with errors all over the process over a period of up to 12 to 18 hours before the dangerous failure occurred. So the contention here is that we should have a lot of opportunity to detect these as these events are starting to build. What are the observable conditions out there? I don't care if it's a virus. I don't care if it's a machine failure. I don't care what's going on. They typically often manifest in the same type of problems down on the, uh, the, the, uh, the same types of problems from an, an ICS network perspective. If I'm monitoring the traffic on the network and I see anomalies, spikes in these types of things and others, well, then I have a really good idea that something is not going right. But it doesn't give you a complete picture. Network errors happen all the time on a network. You have to be able to do what we'll talk about in a moment correlation to other things within the environment. So TCP errors, including fast retransmissions, duplicate acts, retransmissions, window, window, screen, uh, window size shrinkage within the TCP packets, excessive round trip time, time to live, try, I can go on and on and on. There are a number of these, and, and again, 
by themselves, a couple of these events are probably not that big of a deal. In clusters and then compared to other events within the process, we can use these to put together a picture of we have an impending failure starting to occur. All right? So bringing it all together, so we look at the, again, looking at the network traffic patterns over time, looking at the failure pattern, trying to do some type of comparative analysis to what our process trends are, we start developing a mechanism by which we can say, well, hey, the industrial network is a causal factor in these other process failures. And what I'll say is that, you know, in, in, over the past eight years, this has been the technique that folks like myself have applied, but we've done it very manually over the past few years. We'll go through, we'll gather statistics and data off the industrial network. We'll then start looking at other process trends. We'll look at things that are going on the historian, look at causal fact, factor analysis, look at uh, support tickets, talk to the folks there at the local site, and we'll start putting the picture together of, well, you're seeing these types of, of failures happen on the ICS network. We can correlate to those particular trends. Well, now that we know that, the, that there is some type of causal factor behind that, let's go and start addressing what those network failures are and then, uh, you know, and, and subsequently measuring the improvement in the performance of the process. All right. Kind of reconsidering these risk approaches then. So rather than trying to go through complicated mechanisms of measuring vulnerabilities uh, when you're trying to assess in a network uh, or measuring the return on investment for security and things like that, what we do instead is count the number of these events over time. Look at the events that we can get direct correlation to, you know, that, hey, every time we see this spike in communications traffic you know, uh, and, and can compare it, we see it over here happening within the process trend, well, I think we have a problem with a network, uh, a network switch that's, that doesn't have the proper capacity or a network card that's dying or things like that. So we start measuring what were these certain events and then, uh, then reducing those certain events. Well, obviously, at that point, we start, we start, we can, we can have a correlated, uh, uh, um, measurement of improvement within the process itself as well. So we look at reducing certain events and then reducing overall uncertainty in the network by getting a better visibility into what's actually happening on the process. For process control, that really means associating the ICS network to process performance, and that, that is something that really just has not been done to date. Most people know they have an industrial network. Most people know that it causes problems occasionally. Most people know they have a process and that it has problems occasionally. Very few people actually put those two pictures together, and for those of us that have been doing uh, this type of work in industrial environments for a number of years now, this is something we've been doing manually for quite some time, and, and this is how we've been going through and addressing a lot of security threats within networks. The main key here is to present this information to operators. Right now, nobody has an, a screen that says your network is having a bad day, right? They may see evidence of network failures and things of that nature, but there's no dashboard, there's no KPI, there's no nothing, there's nothing else out there to tell you something's not really right on the industrial network and that somebody could actually start doing some causal, causal factor analysis to get, to, to head off a lot of these problems at the past. What, what we've often seen is there is plenty of evidence before an industrial process fails on the networking perspective. Right, so if we're actually getting some information presented back to the operators, we get early warning of these impending failures. All right. So the idea here would be to, uh, when we all use KPIs for measuring our process performance. We all use KPIs for measuring how well the operations are doing. The key here would be to get a KPI, get this type of information available that looks at industrial networking trends, performance trends over time, does that comparison to other process trends to, to generate meaningful, complex, calculated KPIs that tell us, again, you have what's, what is going on on your industrial network, what's the health of the overall industrial network, and then if you see anomalies or failures on the network, can we sit there and say that there was some type of impact to the process? The one I typically use, uh, this is not the only one by any stretch, and not everybody uses OEE. I have found it to be one that, that's pretty effective. Uh, but the one, but the, uh, the the basics, we're not going to get into a lot of OEE today, but, but the basics of it are, if you don't use it already, it is what's the theoretical maximum output for this machine, for this line, for this process. So let's say it's, uh, uh, let's say it's cases. So if the theoretical maximum that this line should be able to operate is 1,200 cases an hour, and I only put 800 cases out, and uh, 800 
300 cases out during that hour. What are the causal factors that caused me to, to, to miss 400 cases? Now, there's going to be a lot of things out there. There's going to be maintenance causes. There's going to be uh, there's going to be training causes. There's going to be other maintenance failures. There could be raw material inputs, all kinds of things like that. But if you start to peel the layers back, we often find that there are network and process performance issues as well that are that are contributing factors into why we did not achieve the theoretical maximum output during that time. So when we start start gathering the correct data, gathering anomalous traffic that's happening on the industrial network, doing the correlation, and start comparing it to other KPIs within the historian or within our databases, we can get a picture of where are my failures, where are the things that are causing me from a network and process perspective to not perform as well as I can. Right. Again, this doesn't factor in any type of secure. This doesn't factor any type of intentional versus unintentional. All I care about is the fact that they're occurring at this point. How do I gather this data? We use span ports on switches where we monitor the monitor and and, and uh, monitor the traffic that is at the network. Tra the the uh, uh, monitor the traffic at the point of the network switches themselves. Uh, we can use active network taps. If you're familiar with what those are, I basically tap into the line of communication between devices so that I can gather the actual packet stream as the devices are communicating. Uh, sniffers, capture filters, snort rules, uh, snort or any other type of IDS rules for out there. Intrusion detection system that we do an anomalous detection of. Oh, you can do detection of anomalous traffic over time that meets certain types of patterns. It's definitely important to analyze this traffic over time, however, going back to some of the earlier slides, that if you don't have a picture of what's happening over time over a long, what would typically are very long TCP session times in industrial devices, you're not going to see the, the, the incidents that are probably actually causing those failures. Again, if we use our typical IT type networking rules uh, of, of analyzing network traffic, we're only going to be looking for individual sessions over a few seconds. We typically don't look at these long TCP state times and realize that, oh, Look, you know, a momentary glitch could be all that's required to cause an interruption. And remember back to the slide we talked about where you could have up to 19 independent sessions. If there's any communication lapses in any of that chain, it could be enough for the whole chain to break. Right? And, the, and the, kind of the, the key principle here is associating these events to process performance. What's happening? Why did I not hit 1,200 cases an hour? There's going to be a lot of causal factors there, but if I can start figuring out that I'm losing 100 cases an hour to process, uh, process failures that are happening because of, of, of uh, 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 unexpected latency or uh, latency in the network or delays in the network or communication lapses and problems, I have a really good idea of if when I start to re resolve those uh, of how much I've been able to improve the process performance. So kind of in summary here really quickly, and I'll, I'll tie this back to security briefly before I hand it back over, the challenge really, it is, it is a big challenge today still to justify security. And, and a lot of that really boils down to we still not, do not have a large reporting of security incidents out there. We don't have a lot of information about the actual threats that are going after industrial control systems. That's been that way for quite a bit of time now. So we've had a lot of companies that come back and say, well, what's the point of spending all this money on security? We don't have enough information out there to prove that things are actually going on. Well, this type of analysis is the same thing that guys like myself and many others have been doing for several years now, and we've seen the evidence that there are network security problems, there are other performance problems out there that are causing companies not only to, to you know, to, to have problems with security and, and, you know, in general, but they're actually losing, they're losing the ability to maintain safe and efficient operation of their plants, and they don't even know it yet because they're not looking at the traffic, they're not looking, doing the correlation that is going to give them an idea of, hey, you know, again, everybody knows they have a network, everybody knows they have a process. Not everybody knows to look at both of them at the same time. There's a significant, there is a significant gap in understanding between the process performance and network performance. And, and, and most of these failures manifest in very measurable ways. Even the, every virus out there I've seen typically has the same type of, of things that can be measured on the network. They all show the same type of, of uh, baseline performance characteristics or performance impact characteristics on the industrial network. So as a result, if we are correlating, if we're detecting when those types of anomalies occur on the network, and then doing a subsequent correlation, we can get either, you know, get a couple of different things. We can either get in, uh, an early warning of an impending failure, or we can get an idea that, hey, something is going on on the network and we need to go out and actually uh, you know, do some causal analysis and figure out uh, what do we need to do to remove that threat.
Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's the latest virus coming out or if it's an age-old attack or if it's not even an attack at all. If you're doing this type of a correlation, you're going to have an idea that something's going going wrong in your network long before uh, any other security company comes out with a with a, a, a virus notification or a threat warning or anything else out there. The key, though, is to determine the causal factors and, and make sure that you have clear KPIs and that uh, as you're developing these systems that you have a meaningful comparative analysis between what's happening between the two. So with that, I believe that really wraps up my side of the presentation. Thank you, Brian. I couldn't have asked for a nicer segue. So what I'm going to talk about now is basically a continuation of exactly what Brian said. There are a lot of tools that are available for monitoring IT networks. Um, from the network standpoint, we have um, IT monitoring tools for network capacity, utilization, performance. Um, from the security side, we have the tools to detect and report and collect information on intentional attacks that can often lead to the exact same faults. Um, and in most cases, and certainly in the case of security information and event management systems, which is what Nitro Security does, um, we have single tools that do all of those things. However, IT security tools require specialized functionality if you're going to use them to support this correlation between the IT network and the industrial control system network. You know, as Brian mentioned, um, the IT network does not equal the IC networks. There are lots of different qualities. Um, in the very obvious levels, there are entirely new applications and entirely new protocols that many, uh, you know, quote, typical security devices built for enterprise networks wouldn't even understand. Um, so you need that specialized support. You need your IT tools to understand the context and the protocols and the utilization and everything that you expect from your ICS networks. Um, and you also need the operational views within that tool that apply to that industrial control system. Um, again, the context is just entirely different. Um, you don't particularly care that it's a denial of service attack. However, you may certainly care that there is um, that there is increased latency or latency variation caused by that attack, or perhaps even the you know the outright uh, destruction of, of network communication that would take a process or a safety system down. <clears throat> and to draw that line, you need the correlation between those two items. Um, and we've been talking about how we can do it manually for a while, and I'm going to uh, start talking about how we can automate that. Now, I have a little nice to have down at the bottom of this slide, and that's about compliance. Because um, I hear on a regular basis how um, IT security spending is often shaped by, driven by, um, certainly influenced by compliance regulations, ISA 99, NERC SIP, um, CFATS, um, the various uh, nuclear regulatory NEI regulations. Um, they all focus on documentation, and documentation is there for a reason. It's it's the proof, it's the audit trail that these security systems are in place and operating as, as they should. Now, if you have the appropriate tools in place to monitor the IT networks and the IC networks, then the, the great bonus is that you have that visibility required to produce those audit reports as well. So all said and done, if, um, if everything goes according to plan, you should be able to implement best practice security monitoring and analysis and sort of get compliance as a bonus. Now, I talked about you know, support for IT and ICS, but I'm going to spread it out a little bit more. Okay, so I'm going to go a little, bit, um, a little bit deeper. And I'm going to talk about three networks. I'm going to talk about the enterprise network as the IT network, and the industrial control system network, or the operational network, or the OT network. And in between, I think a lot of people have um, some sort of a DMZ, so they have a supervisory um, environment. Now, I realize this can change considerably from environment to environment, and it's going to change from industrial manufacturing to nuclear to chemical to you know, electrical energy, et cetera. Um, so just for monitoring purposes here, I want to talk about uh, three systems. Now, in order to correlate information in an automated fashion, you have to collect information from these three different systems. And the big issue here is that those three systems, um, and again, again, it could be more than three, are separate. They should be separate, and you shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't have insecure communications going between them. So you need native collection, you need local collection of the relative uh, pieces of information. You need a way to get the information together in a way that's not going to violate um, the same security practices um, that you're trying to uphold, so that you can get both local visibility in specific operational areas, but also global visibility. 
And that global visibility is going to be what's going to allow you to take two discrete data points. Maybe it's latency on the enterprise side um, or even in the SCADA demilitarized zone and some sort of operational efficiency metric um, within the operational system. Um, what that typically means is that you have to put some sort of a, um, certainly a firewall, um, or in some cases, especially in, in uh, extremely critical networks such as nuclear facilities, um, it may actually be mandated that you have to go further than that and put one way, you know, hard air-gapped communications in and um, something like a data diode. Um, certainly you want to have high-level crypto going on on top of that. Um, you don't want um, this sensitive information um, leaking in the during the process of your security management. So another problem comes in what we call normalization. And normalization is the taking of different pieces of data with different contexts and applying them together so that you can draw um, correlations and relationships between them. Now, if you look at something that might come out of a historian system, for example, I have some events from a PI system here. Um, we have things like uh, failed logins to the PI server itself. We also have things like points being created and points being deleted. Um, where do those fall in a, in a security event taxonomy? In order to draw those correlations, everything has to be um, categorized appropriately. So um, that's another one of these specialized things we have to look at when we're looking at our tools and how to customize them to our environment. We need to know that um, we need to know that there's authentication capability in an industrial network that could occur at the protocol level. Um, it could occur between an MTU and an, and an IED. It could occur between an HMI and a PLC. It may not involve hard users. You may have a console that is um, that is always on and is performing an operational function, and the access control to that console is um, is the physical room that it's in, and the locks and physical control systems to enter that control room. Um, I, I certainly don't recommend that, but I know for a fact that that, uh, that type of operation is still widely used. <clears throat> and the, the second piece of data analysis that we need to, to really talk about here is exactly what Brian mentioned earlier in that you can't analyze data in minute um, periods of time. You have to analyze it over time. So you need to be able to look at this information, whether it's um, on the information security side, IT side, or on the operational or industrial control system side. Um, typically, on the ICS side, something like um, time-correlated baselines are extremely valuable because you have very well-defined um, metrics. You have operations that occur at certain times, a shift start at certain times, processes um, ramp up, batches occur. Um, you know, whatever the industrial process is that you're managing is extremely well-defined. Um, if it wasn't, it couldn't be automated. And so when we look at that and we correlate it in the context of time, now a time correlated baseline means that if I'm looking at a week, I know that Mondays at three are um, higher impact than Tuesdays at noon. Um, so you have the context of um, scheduling around that baseline calculation. <clears throat> when you apply that to industrial operation parameters, you can very quickly see using a tool that you know is essentially designed for information security analysis that you might have uh, an anomalous activity on the operation side that's of extreme concern. You tie the two together, and you can do that because you've normalized them. Then you can draw a correlation between something that happens on the IT side and the ICS side, exactly what Brian was talking about, um, but now in an automated system. So an, an example of that, and um, and I just made up some examples. Um, I'm sure there are probably security analysts out there that would look at my examples and think that they were pretty um, pretty amateurish, but I'm, I'm not a hacker, so bear with me. Um, an example of a correlation rule, and a correlation rule, and just let me explain what that is um, for those of you not familiar, is a combination of events or pattern of events that occur um, yeah, according to a logic tree, so you have Boolean, ands, ors, and you have sequences. When you look at these events as a pattern in combination, they equal something that's much more significant than each um, event uh, on its own. So, for example, this first clump of three at the top where we have, um, we have an event ID from a security management system that has been classified as a malware or exploit. Um, that could be anything from signs of a virus, 
It could be an event from an application whitelisting um, agent such as um, McAfee application whitelisting or host IDS type um, alerts. Um, we have that combined with the source IP um, on a network flow, and a network flow is basically the, the communication link um, on the Ethernet TCP IP network, where the source is outside of your SCADA environment, um, but the destination is a control system HMI. So those are all things that we can monitor just looking at the IT network. We're looking at TCP IP, we're looking at flows, and we're looking at security classifications. Um, what that means when you look at those three together is that there's a reason to suspect that that HMI um, may have been um, accessed by some sort of um, some sort of outside user, or certainly at least has been attempted to be accessed. Um, now again, Brian talked about how it's really the result that we're concerned about and not necessarily the cause. Um, and that's absolutely true. The result is going to be the same. Um, a successful attack um, from, a, from a hacker versus um, latency caused by, who knows, a sun flare, could be the exact same cause and is the cause that's most important. But when you're analyzing from a security standpoint, sometimes you want to look the other way around um, because sometimes you can see indications of an incident prior to when they occur. Um, so in that case, you have the chance to, um, you see, you're seeing causes, and you don't know what the result is, but then you then, you then investigate those causes, and hopefully you find, um, you find the result before it becomes, becomes a catastrophic failure. So we take that first combination of events, and then we add some, uh, you know, other things to them. Um, for example, the HMI activity starts exceeding normal baseline. Well, now what we're doing is we're looking at data that we might get from a historian, right? So you, um, and actually, this could come from either side. You could see network traffic anomalies, an HMI that's generating more network traffic than, than normal. Or you might see on the operational side, you might see specific um, loss of efficiencies or specific uh, variations in whatever metrics you're, you're managing um, on the process loops that are controlled by that HMI. And then um, in the case of, you know, I have to say Stuxnet because I, I don't think you can do a security presentation these days without using the word Stuxnet. Um, but perhaps you see set points being changed. Perhaps you see the uh, frequency that a motor is set to spin at fluctuate from a very low number to a very high number, um, which is the end result of the Stuxnet um, attack. You look at these things all together, and this is an example of how IT information and ICS information together can indicate something that's significantly wrong. Now, if I put this back in the context of my uh, my simplified network graph, graph we have um, we have a, a, a more visual indication of how these events all come from different places. Um, and I have a different example here. This is a um, this is a network performance impact where we see um, we see two things that could happen on the IT or SCADA networks, um, but all of which will result in um, suboptimal network performance. Um, in a pure IT environment, we might have really anomalous flow volumes. So there's just more people communicating on the network than there used to be. Um, that could be just because there's, um, there, there was a hiring spree, there are more people on the network. It could be because um, you know Google had one of their famous video game logos on their homepage and everybody decided to connect to the web and play with it. Um, it could be that there is a spam bot sending spam out of the corporate uh, mail server. It could be a lot of things. Um, there could be DOS attacks or DDoS attacks inbound or outbound. Um, there are a lot of things that could cause suboptimal network performance. Now, again, we'll flip back to the original point that Brian made, which is that the, the cause doesn't really matter. The event is going to be the same. In this case, what we're going to see is we're going to see errors. We're going to see alarms. We're going to see process failures. We're going to see fluctuations in um, synchronization between the industrial protocols and basically a failure of the industrial operational systems. Now I have another example, which is the, uh, the Stuxnet class attack. And, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not a security analyst or a hacker, so forgive me if, um, forgive me if this probably wouldn't work. Um, but this is where you see complex events that in combination mean there are real threat activities on the enterprise IT side. You have a, um, you have a command and control botnet. It's using outbound web traffic um, from non-web servers, it's using Base64 encoded traffic within the HTTP protocol, hidden way down at the at the internal levels. Now, this is um, this is classic APT threat uh, threat activity. If you combine that 
with malware events um, or maybe authentication anomalies or, or any anomaly really within the SCADA environment, and you see um, abnormal point changes. So with that time correlated baseline, you know that that set point shouldn't be being altered or that um, or these tags shouldn't be adjusted at this time. Um, all of those things, well, the 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 botnet certainly is um, something to worry about um, for the IT guys. But the other two events, they're just anomalies. They're they're not that serious. But when you take them all three together, you can say, whoa, this is um, you know this is a this is an advanced persistent threat that has impenetrated my um, my SCADA system. It's it's installed malware. That malware is now actively uh, affecting my industrial control system. So how do we get all this information? You know, there's three different pieces, and they're from three different environments that are physically separated. So uh, I have here, I have a diagram of a fairly um, fairly common security event uh, analysis process. And then I've broken, um, I've broken the bottom process out, which is the event collection and analysis. So before you can do things like case management and compliance reporting and you know change control and forensic investigations, all that fun stuff, you always hear um, information security people talk about. You have to collect the information and you have to look at it and you have to analyze it. In order to do what we're talking about, Today, um, you need to be pulling information from the HMIs. You need to be pulling information from the historians. You need to be pulling information from your IT environment. But what a lot of people um, fail to realize is that, or I, I don't think they fail to realize it, uh, information security people tend to overlook it, I think, is that HMI systems might run on Windows and historians might run on Windows or maybe they run on Linux. Um, and those server logs are important, and the behavior of those servers are important, but it's what those systems are really doing that's of the most importance, right? So um, it's not the historian itself. It's not the physical server, and it's not its operating system. It's all of the tag data that that historian is managing, all of the same information that you use to monitor and manage process efficiency needs to be collected into those IT security tools. Now, once they're in there, um, they have to be normalized, as I mentioned. You can't, uh, you can't correlate information until you can look at it all in the same context. And so this requires um, an understanding between IT and OT systems. And those IT and OT systems often don't um, have an obvious contextual relationship. So this is all, um, we're doing a lot of this work right now, um, Nitro Security, um, working with um, with several groups, um, and actually OSI Soft, the makers of Pi Historian, are, are huge of huge assistance in this area. And working to develop a normalized taxonomy that does apply to IT and OT systems together. And by doing this, um, we have a huge step towards being able to correlate these things in an automated fashion. Now. Um, in addition to normalizing all these events as they come in, we actually need to store them. And that's something that people are going to need to plan for as well, because we're talking about information collection here. Um, the good news is that that information is going to be very valuable for compliance when it comes time to um, produce those compliant reports and go through audit. Um, the bad news is you're talking about a lot of information. Um, typical information security in a pure IT environment already taxes um, both um, the systems that manage them and the uh, and the people that manage the systems. It's just a lot of information. Everything is producing data. Now when we add the operational system onto that, um, anybody who works with a historian system on a daily basis knows that the amount of uh, information managed by those systems is, is as massive, if not more. And now what we're doing is we're combining them together. So, um, so there are some um, there are some definitely some considerations you need to make there as well as to the amount of information that you need to manage. And then once you have everything, um, you have it all collected, you have it all normalized and stored, you need to be able to correlate it and you need to be able to analyze it. Um, that's the end result almost because then once you've correlated and analyzed it again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean on something that Brian said earlier and that's that it needs to be presented to the operators. Now, in this case, it needs to be presented to two operators. Um, you have your security operations center or your SOC, um, and you have the actual uh, the process operations managers. So you want this information to go in two places. You want it to go to your security console and your um, process console. 
you know, I, I teased people along the way about compliance. Um, I don't think uh, I, I'm probably the least qualified to verse people um, in this audience on the specific compliance requirements that you face on a daily basis. I know they're severe and, and changing, and, um, and there's a lot of heartache and headache that goes along with it. Um, but when you do have this type of information, you have, uh, you have again, armed yourself with information that is going to significantly make this process easier. Um, for example, if you have IC, uh, the ICS device configurations that are being tracked, um, along with the IT device configurations, you're going to have a good overall picture of change, change control, change management, authorized changes versus unauthorized changes. You can figure that all out. Um, you can set the system up to produce those reports automatically. Um, and, uh, and I'll apologize to you, Brian, for using pure NERC SIP examples here rather than um, rather than ISA 99 examples. So that's all that I have um, for today. Um, we do have a little bit of time left, and we can go over to answer questions if there are any. Um, I'm guessing that there probably are quite a few because we've talked about some pretty interesting and new topics on this call. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Jerry and open the call up for questions. Thanks, Eric. And Brian, thank you as well. We do have uh, some time for questions and a, a couple a couple lined up. This is a question for Brian. Um, with all of the hype that has been surrounding Stuxnet, some statements have been made that uh, air gap separation is no longer in existence. Uh, do you agree with that? And, and if so, why or why not? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think the first thing you said there, uh, hype around Stuxnet is one of the first things you really want to key in on, uh, and, and that's very much true. You know, I think there's a lot of hype around Stuxnet. Now, that's not to say that what it, what's come out of that is not, uh, well, somewhat revolutionary in many ways. It has a, a quite a few capabilities we really haven't seen in malware so far, and it is interesting, but it is also a virus, and it is a, is a piece of malware, and the, the disciplines around analyzing and detecting and remediating those things, well, that, those have been around quite a while and so I always try to remind people that as, as we see that you know we know what we're doing here, folks. Uh, we know how to address this. It's just a matter of understanding what it is and then putting the right fixes in place. Now, to the to the to the key of your question, however, is you know, is this, does this is, are there no longer such a thing as air gapped? Well, if you've been following most of us in the industry since the, about the year 2001 and talking about this, the contention has long been there really no is there is no such thing as an air gap network. Uh, and I and, and all the and all the networks I've ever, I've ever looked at and in about you know as many years of doing this as we have, I've only seen one environment I would actually consider to be completely isolated. And it literally was completely isolated, down to the point where the USB ports were glued shut, uh, but it was also only about three machines inside of four walls. Uh, we always find that there is some type of communication, and, and that could be anywhere as simple as a non-IP-based wire going out of the device that somebody uses, uh, like an environmental control system or something like that, for example. Uh, or it could be has a modem still plugged up to it that is only supposed to be hooked up at certain times during the day. Or it could be as, as the, way, the way Stuxnet works in that the number one tool for backing up control devices is typically somebody walking around with a USB drive. Uh, and all you got to do is take that USB drive home and plug it back up at the wrong time, and guess what? You're compromised. Uh, and, I, and so as a result, you know, a lot of people say, well, this means air gap is gone. I think most of us would actually contend to say that it's, it's never really been there. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people get a very false sense of security thinking that they were air gapped. And so just because you think you don't have a connection doesn't necessarily excuse you from, uh, from still implementing good security practices. Uh, and if I can add to that, you know, I used the example of the data diode. Um, <coughs> A data diode is an excellent example of a way where you can force communication to only be allowed in one direction. It's a physical layer separation. Um, right. But no matter how hard that barrier is, um, it's not perfect isolation. You can still walk around it. Again, the right. USB example, somebody walking with a USB drive. Um, there, is a, um, there was a really interesting presentation at one of the Sanskata summits a few years ago, and I believe it was Jason Larson from the INL. Um, that presented this, and apologies to him if I, if I've got it, him if I've got that wrong. But there was actually um, there was actually research where, um, in a research environment, they were able to access a um, industrial system over a wireless chip that was implemented in a microprocessor in a device that was never enabled. Um, so you have a microprocessor manufacturer that has built-in Wi-Fi um, for cost purposes. That chip is used in a product. 
It was never intended to have wireless connectivity. We do not enable it, but it still has a little antenna in it. Um, so, you know, in the in the extreme sophistication level, um, there, yeah, there is absolutely no such thing as an air gap. Okay. Thank you both for that one. Um, the next question is: Is it appropriate to look at a historian system as a log management type of system for ICS devices? Uh, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know if I would say that a historian is a log management system for ICS devices. Um, historians, um, and and you know, I'll open this with a wide open disclaimer at the beginning, in that historians uh, are made by lots of vendors, and lots of them operate in very specific or very wide ways. You have um, historians like the, like the Pi historian, which is uh, I think fairly ubiquitously deployed, where it's doing a lot more than just uh, data collection; it's doing a lot of analysis and. Et cetera. So it's tracking a lot of uh, it's tracking a lot of activity. Um, does that make it a log management system? No, it makes it a data management system, um, and that data can be used by a system like a security information and event management system, um, which is a log management system. So in that case, you'd be sort of producing log activity in proxy by extracting this information out of the historian's uh, system. Uh, that's certainly what we're doing. We're seeing a we're seeing a lot of success with that. Um, but no, I don't. I don't think I would call a historian a log management system on its own. All right. I, I think to add to that, you know, it's it's kind of interesting because it, it somewhat depends upon the industry type you're at as well. And, and like, uh, you know, I've worked in a lot of the uh, CPG or the consumer packaged good industries where they look at things at a lot more granular level, down to a machine or device uh, device performance levels and things like, especially in like a packaging line. And in that case, sometimes people do look at that for the performance of an individual device over time. But but you know, as Jerry said, it really is more of an information or a data management system than it is anything else. Uh, and there. Are are other systems out there that do a far better job of that type of uh, of that type of analysis than a historian would anyway? I mean, there are, there are plenty of configuration management and log aggregation tools and things like that that would be more appropriate for looking at at uh, device performance on an individual level or device health overall. Okay, uh, we have time for one last question, and I think this one is for Brian. Brian, you talked about the industrial network itself being a root cause for process failure. Do you see the same type of activity happening in very, very flat networks, or is this more common in very hierarchical networks? Uh, I think the answer to that is just a simple yes, uh, and and this comes from I, I used to run a, a an entire business around industrial network and uh, industrial networking performance and uh, troubleshooting and design, and it really didn't matter. I've seen plenty of places that had extended failures. I mean, we're we're talking about process failures that spanned uh, you know performance issues spanning six, ten, twelve months or longer in many cases. That there were very simple causal factors going on behind that on the industrial network, whether it be bad termination on fiber or something that simple uh, or, or on you know control net cables or something like that uh, all the way up to uh, minor misconfigurations in spanning tree or other type of redundancy protocols that you know, resulted in cascading faults kind of moving around the network over time uh, so I would say you're if you look at a relatively flat network you you probably have a lot of your work cut out for you anyway in terms of it's going to be easy to see things like multicast traffic causing pro intermittent failures of the industrial process uh, or if you go you could get into a Complicated as multi-level networks with DMZs and firewalls and you know every type of, of structure out there known to man uh, in redundancy and yeah the, the problems just get a lot more difficult to diagnose but they're they're no less significant or no less prevalent. Okay, and, and from a security standpoint, if I can just add um, a, a short comment onto that, from a security standpoint, um, you certainly want to isolate and separate um, devices as well, not just devices but functions right. systems. Um, if you have a flat network with a firewall in front of it, every legitimate communication needs to poke a hole in that firewall. If um, if all devices are on the same network behind the same firewall, you have a lot of holes. And you can go through one hole and attack a different system. Where if you isolate things where they belong, you're basically breaking that network up so it's no longer flat. Um, separating it further with specific firewalls, um, IPSs, with specific policies that allow very specific um, uh, types of traffic from very specific sources and destinations, then you have um, you have a much more reliable, I think, and a much a much safer network. Okay, um, that's all the time that we have. I'd like to thank our audience for participating today. I'd like to thank Brian Singer and Eric Knapp for their uh, excellent insight and contributions. 
uh, for Nitro Security. This is Jerry Skirla. And once again, thanks to our host, Electric Energy Online, for organizing today's webcast on situational awareness in industrial networks.